Look through any camera menu and video editor and you'll find this. Tons of video codecs that can be overwhelming and have seemingly endless configurations. Well, the bad news is that you need to learn at least the basics if you want to go pro. The good news, I'm going to break it down for you as easily as I can. The truth is, video codecs are actually only part of what can be considered the essentials that you should know. So we're gonna do this video in two parts. Part one is gonna talk about the types of codecs commonly available for capture and post-production, and the basics of how to differentiate between the various codecs out there, whether you're shooting, editing, or delivering your finished video. Part two is gonna go into the details of video standards and how they relate to codec choice. We're going to talk largely about codec complexity there, so if you've ever wondered what bit depth and chroma subsampling are, or why us camera nerds get so excited when a camera says that it can shoot in 422, well, you'll wanna stay for part two as well. So what is a codec? Codec is actually a combined shorthand word for encoder plus decoder, and they're formats that video or audio data can be recorded as. Codecs are typically used to compress this data into a smaller form, but that's not always the case. Some codecs are ideal for recording from a camera, while others are better suited for editing. Some consume more space, but are easy to play back, while others are much smaller, but require a powerful computer to play back. Writing a video, that is recording it in a camera or exporting it from an editor, is referred to as encoding, while playing it back is referred to as decoding. But please, Listen carefully. You want to know what a codec isn't? Any of these. What you see here, these are called containers, and they are not the same as codecs. This might sound pedantic, but trust me, if an editor asks you what format you shot something in, don't tell them MOV. I'm sorry, but this really does matter, because containers do exactly that. They contain things like video, audio, subtitles, timecode, chapter markers, and all sorts of metadata. And those things can be encoded in a wide variety of codecs, so it doesn't really tell you everything you need to know about the video. But have you ever wondered why all these various codecs are even necessary? H.264, HEVC, ProRes, older options like MPEG-2. I know there's someone out there who remembers real video. Well, there are lots of reasons why there are all these different codecs for different purposes, but there's really one main reason. File size. Video is huge. You've almost certainly heard of or at least seen bit rates before, but just for reference, even standard definition video, depending on how you define that, when uncompressed, requires about 221 megabits per second. A 30 minute video would be nearly 50 gigabytes in size. Now you can only imagine how big that could get for HD or 4K. Well, no, you can calculate it if you wish, but how are we supposed to work with that? How can we reduce the file size to something more manageable that we can record to SD media, edit quickly, upload online, and stream instantaneously? Now we can talk about video compression. Codecs work on several principles, and we're gonna keep it as simple as possible here since it's very easy to get into the weeds here, but there are actually ways to save data before you use a video codec. You don't need to know how they work on a mathematical or design level, but you do need to know how they work on a practical level so that you can choose the right ones for your needs. So we already brought up bit rates. You're probably thinking the higher the bit rate, the better looking the video, right? Very broadly speaking, this is true, but codecs look to reduce the amount of data in the image so that fewer bits are needed to represent it. And some codecs do this better than others. We'll save the specifics for part two, but there are several fundamental ways that codecs reduce this data. Many, but not all codecs, break up their images into something called macro blocks. How exactly this is done depends on the codec, but to keep it very simple, the blocks are estimations of the original image, and the more bits you have, the better those estimations can be, and the more detailed the image becomes. When you have too few bits, you get the typical blocking artifacts that you see in overcompressed video. It's worth noting that cleaner, less detailed parts of a video are generally easier to compress than noisier, more detailed parts. If you've ever tried to apply a film grain effect to your video, then upload it online and it looks like a mushy, artifacted mess, this is what you're witnessing. 
The other main way that codecs save data is by using something called interframe coding. We'll revisit this at the end of the video, but the basic way that it works is this. A series of images might only have portions of the frame that move. This is especially true for shots like moving head interviews or landscape shots. The background mostly remains static. Because the frames are so similar, the codec can instead only encode the first frame in the shot and then reconstruct the next few frames from that original frame and only encode the changes between them. This technique dramatically reduces the bits needed to encode a video, especially in shots with little motion in them, but it does have its potential downsides, which again, we'll talk about later on. What we've described so far falls under what are called lossy codecs, but there are actually codecs that are designed to be lossless, which means that when viewed, they are identical to the original version, Lossless codecs are useful, first and foremost, for preserving the quality of the image, but also to prevent generational loss. Let's say you have a video in a format that your editor can't open. You might need to convert that video, but converting it to something lossy means that you risk lowering the quality, right? Realistically, you could probably get away with using a high bitrate form of ProRes, and it would look just fine. But if you're going high anyway in terms of bitrate, you might want to simply use a lossless codec. So how do they work? In the case of lossless codecs, there are a few ways to go about it, but at an extremely simple level, the codec will determine if neighboring pixels can be repeated because they're identical. In practice, this doesn't save much space for real world video because of how much natural detail, variation, and noise there is in the image, but in something animated or say a computer graphic, the savings can be noticeable. If you've ever worked with PNG images before, it's a similar idea. Those are lossless, and you might have noticed that they tend to work exceptionally well on simple graphics and solid colors. Beyond that though, for the sake of this video, we'll ignore lossless for now, as it's not commonly seen in workflows outside of visual effects and high-end cinema. So how do we choose the right codec? Well, we're not quite there yet, but here's what you need to ask yourself. Are you delivering for broadcast or professional use? Broadcasters often have minimum bit depth and color sampling standards, things we'll discuss in part two. They might even require that the camera record to an intra-frame codec, which we'll talk about in a bit. And when sending your finished video, you need to consider their delivery specs too. This of course then informs what kind of camera you can shoot with. What recording media do you have to use? You might decide you need a camera that can shoot in 10-bit 422 all intra, which means you need a card that can record it fast enough and has enough space to store all of it. Then you have to ask, are you looking for quick turnaround and editing? If you don't intend to edit or color grade much at all, or the highest quality isn't as important for your video, you might want to shoot directly to a format that can be played on most devices, even phones, and doesn't have the highest bitrate. Do you need to conserve storage space? Higher quality video generally takes up more space, but some codecs might look better at a given bitrate than others. As a rule of thumb, newer codecs generally look better at the same bitrate, or look the same at a lower bitrate, but it does get nuanced. Do you need the utmost image fidelity for grading? If you plan on color grading, you'll definitely want to use a codec that supports higher bit depths and color sampling, along with a higher bitrate overall. You'll also likely shoot in a log color profile, but that's another topic altogether. Do you need a codec that your computer can decode easily? Some codecs are easier to decode, that is playback, depending on your computer, and higher data rates also require faster drives to work off of. You might need to use proxy files, or maybe you can use a camera that automatically shoots proxies on its own to make your turnaround time faster. This touches upon something called codec complexity, and we're gonna get more into that in part two but a higher complexity codec is harder to decode. It's why some codecs might stutter on your computer when you play them back, but usually the benefit of more complex codecs is the quality. They can generally preserve more quality at a lower file size. Lower complexity codecs are, you guessed it, easier to play back, but require more data to achieve the same quality. In the end, what you're looking at is a triangle of options. High quality, low bitrate, and low complexity. Pick two. Higher quality requires either a higher bitrate or a more sophisticated codec, so you can keep that quality high if you choose a simple high bitrate codec like ProRes 422HQ or DNxHR. But you better make sure you have the storage for it. Or you could shoot to HEVC long-op 10-bit 422 and record to a fraction of the size, 
but I hope your computer can handle it or that you're willing to use proxies. Alternatively, you could always just shoot to tried and true H.264 8-bit 420, which at this point in time plays back on just about everything. You won't be able to grade much with it, but it saves space, looks good enough for quick videos, and on most modern hardware, should cut pretty smoothly. So let's take a look at some use cases to give you an idea of the options out there. You can mostly break this down into three categories. Capture or acquisition, editing, and delivery. By the way, we're gonna skip over VFX workflows here as they can easily dive into less common formats. Capture or acquisition refers to what the camera records your video to. Now I mentioned before that your camera choice might be informed by things like broadcast delivery, color grading needs, computing performance, and storage space. Now, depending on your camera, you might have multiple codec options at your disposal. The lowest complexity options that you tend to find these days, meaning the easiest to play back and edit, would be H.264 in its regular 8-bit 420 form. You could almost say that this is the default video format of the age, and it can really be found everywhere. Video streaming still largely uses it, phones have been shooting it for well over a decade now, Blu-ray discs use it, and yes, most cameras shoot it in one way or another. It actually wasn't always easy to play back, but recent computer hardware trends have made it almost effortless to cut. On paper, it's not really considered low complexity, but in practice, it kind of is these days. However, if you do have ProRes on your camera or record externally to ProRes or DNX HR codecs, those would be considered the lowest complexity options and the easiest to play back. They're very high quality as well, but the bit rates are much, much higher to get there. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have things like HEVC in its 10-bit 422 form, which is likely the most complex codec available on most cameras these days, again, putting raw formats aside. The quality is high, the bit rates can be lower, but it takes a powerful machine to work with. Some cameras also offer both inter- and intra-frame versions of codecs, and this is the only specific detail we're going to get into later on in this part. Your decisions in acquisition directly impact your editing workflow, so let's move on. These days, your choice of editing codec can often be the same as your capture codec, especially for simpler projects, but it depends on what you intend to do with the edit. If you record it in a higher complexity codec, you can try to edit from the original footage, but even with a powerful computer, I recommend you go with a proxy workflow for the smoothest editing experience. If you shot in something lower in complexity, you can likely get away with editing directly off the camera files. Another way your capture affects post-production is not the edit, but the color grade and possibly visual effects. We'll explain more in the next part, but if you plan on color grading, you should pretty much immediately shoot in nothing less than a 10-bit format. And if you wanna do something like chroma keying, a green screen, for example, you'll absolutely wanna take advantage of 422 color. Since these are very common use cases, you could also consider transcoding everything to ProRes 422 HQ or better, so that you gain the benefits of working off high quality versions of the source material that are easier to decode. This is similar to a proxy workflow, but using the HQ version of ProRes means you don't necessarily need to go back to your original camera files. Now, delivery can mean a few things. When a video is finished, ideally, you'll create a high quality master file that can be used to deliver to pretty much any other format. This is typically called a mezzanine file, and high bitrate, high bit depth intraframe codecs are perfect for this. Basically, export your finished video in ProRes or DNxHR and treat that as your master export. From that huge mezzanine file, you can create more manageable versions in H.264 or HEVC for upload to the web or create high quality encodes for something like a film festival, Blu-ray disc, or perhaps as a private upload for a client. Now, you could technically upload ProRes files to sites like YouTube and Vimeo, but bandwidth limitations, not to mention storage quotas of some of these services, make it less realistic. And again, remember that 8-bit H.264 plays back just about anywhere, so for early cuts or preview files, you probably could skip the mezzanine file altogether and just go with that. The big exception to any of this is broadcast and theatrical delivery. Theaters will usually want a DCP, which is something we're not going to go into here, but film festivals might request some of the options we just discussed. Broadcasters and streaming services tend to have very strict requirements about their deliverables, often requiring 10-bit 422 encodes at a minimum, and sometimes require something to be shot that way too. I do still recommend you create a mezzanine file, but where you go with it after that is going to depend on the client you're working with. Okay, everything making sense mostly? 
We're gonna talk about one more thing today, and it's the only somewhat advanced topic we'll get into before part two, because it is an important fundamental to understand. Go into many cameras today, and you'll probably find an option called All Eye, or Intra. And then you might also find the opposite, which is Long Op, Long GOP, or IBP. The first two refer to something called intra-frame coding, while the second two refer to inter-frame coding. What do these mean? Well, I mentioned way back in this video how inter-frame coding is typically used to save a lot of space by only encoding certain whole frames and then encoding the differences between them. Inter-frame coding is one of the most effective ways to reduce video data, and it's pretty much the norm for most lossy codecs. How it works on a technical level depends on the codec variety, but this is the general idea. Intra-frame means that every frame of the video is encoded as a complete frame. Think of it like being able to jump to any page of a flipbook. Or in the still photography world, think of it like a series of burst shots that you've taken. While ProRes and DNX HD codecs are always intra-frame, codecs like H.264 and HEVC come in both inter and intra varieties. Typically, however, those two codecs are used to save space with inter-frame coding. Let's say you have a talking head segment and the background remains largely unchanged. The video is then encoded in sequences called groups of pictures, or GOPs, and at the beginning of each group, you have a complete frame known as an iframe, that is, intra-frame. Following this are P and B frames, which only encode the differences from neighboring frames. This might sound complex, and it is, but trust me, I'm simplifying it a lot. The important thing to know is that this requires more computational power to decode. To go back to the flipbook example, imagine if instead of flipping to any page you desired, you had to copy the background of the first page and then lay the next page on top of it to view the whole image. Interframe codecs do this on a much, much more sophisticated level, and this whole process is why seeking and playback in the edit with interframe tends to be slower. Intraframe codecs always require a higher bitrate than their interframe counterparts because every frame is complete. The trade-off is storage, and you'll see this reflected in your camera's menus and recording times. Interframe, on the other hand, can save a dramatic amount of space, but can require a faster computer to decode. There are also quality concerns, but it's not as clear-cut as you might think. Interframe codecs with too low of a bitrate can sometimes struggle with scenes featuring a lot of movement or noise, and perform best with shots featuring little movement in the image. However, there does come a point where interframe video can look equivalent to intraframe and still come in at a lower file size. More modern interframe codecs, as seen in our Canon C70s and C80s, for example, do hold up remarkably well, and in most circumstances, you'd be hard-pressed to find noticeable differences to their intra versions. This varies from camera to camera and scene to scene, though, so perhaps you could run some camera tests and find out. But anyway, that's a lot, right? I hope you found this to be a helpful introduction to video codecs, especially as far as production is concerned, and make sure to join us for part two, where we'll dive right into codec complexity, hardware compatibility, chroma subsampling, bit depth, and finally, a more comprehensive list of codec recommendations based on some common needs. So let us know in the comments below what codec quandary you find yourself in, and we'll do our best to address it. I'm Doug with B&H, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>